to try to clear the agency's name through the release of records. You know, overall, I thought that the Central Intelligence Agency was very cooperative with us. They didn't appeal any of our decisions. The FBI uh, had a, a, a wonderful set of carefully cataloged records. They fought us for a time on all of our releases. Eventually, they gave up. Secret Service, on the other hand, was very difficult for us to deal with. Perhaps that was not surprising because in November 22nd, 1963 was the worst day by far in the long history of the Secret Service. Everything was done poorly that day. This was a very dangerous situation. An open limousine. Secret Service, on the other hand, was very difficult for us to deal with. Perhaps that was not surprising because in November 22nd, 1963 was the worst day by far in the long history of the Secret Service. Everything was done poorly that day. This was a very dangerous situation. An open limousine, crowds everywhere, buildings not checked, parts of a parade route where the, the vehicles had to slow to almost a stop to make that, that corner there, that, that sharp turn under the book depository building. Now all you have to do is look at the films from that day to see people like within two, three feet of the president as the limousine poked its way down the, down the street. So the Secret Service was entirely revamped and procedures and policies were changed entirely on the basis of what happened that day. There was no coordination with local law enforcement that there should have been. The FBI was following Oswald. I mean, obviously they knew he was working in the school book depository building. Was there any discussion ahead of time that this guy was clearly erratic? A little coordination here would have made all the difference in the world. The FBI and the CIA were listening to his conversations in the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City six or seven weeks before the assassination. They knew what this guy was up to. He was, a, he was erratic. Uh, yet no one checked out his employment in the book depository building. In, in terms of after the fact, I mean, I think the Secret Service was most interested in, in getting, you know, the president obviously to the hospital fast and then getting the body out of Dallas. As far as their motivations, uh, you know, obviously they knew they had failed in their job that day. They failed to protect the president of the United States. Did they cover up things after the fact? They probably covered up, you know, not doing their job very well. During the review board's work in 1995, they did destroy records uh, relating to threat assessments in Dallas uh, before November 22nd, 1963. Lowy hauled them in right away to explain what was going on. No, it was inadvertent. Inadvertent, we're, you've got a law that requires you to present everything to us for our decision. And uh, well, they blamed some low-level person. I mean, it was just... It, it was inexplicable. And Judge Thunheim says the investigation into the assassination... Prostitution, uh, that's illegal. A procurement is illegal. And if you have a procurer with prostitutes, paraded in front of you, then uh, as a sworn law enforcement officer, you, uh, you're you asking yourself, well, what do they think of us? Prostitution, uh, that's illegal. A procurement is illegal. And if you have a procurer with prostitutes paraded in front of you, then uh, as a sworn law enforcement officer, you uh, you're asking yourself, well, what do they think of us? The first night or so I was there, someone uh, took me aside and said that it's a good idea to keep your eyes and ears open and your mouth shut. The first night or so I was there, someone uh, took me aside and said that it's a good idea 
to keep your eyes and ears open and your mouth shut because you're going to see a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't belong outside the agent's um, information. The Secret Service saw another side of Camelot, the dark side. These women were of questionable character. Followed by a carload of press. out here right up to the fence shaking hands and talking with these hundreds of people gathered inside that fenced off area it was a great thrill to them and a complete surprise Tonight we dip back into our archives as we remember. Tonight we dip back into our archives as we remember. But. In a bid to gain more public support in Texas, JFK agrees to a 45-minute motorcade through the streets of Dallas before his planned business lunch. Eight days before the visit, a Secret Service agent checks out the planned route of the motorcade. When he signs it off, the president's fate is sealed. Because the route takes JFK through Dealey Plaza and right past several tall buildings, including the Texas School Book Depository from where the fatal shot will be fired. The threat from any one of those buildings would be great. It was putting the president in a very precarious situation. When you think of protection, it's not just what's at the ground level. You have to think 360 degrees. You don't want to think like a Secret Service agent. You want to think like the assassin. And there's another crucial flaw that's been missed. Approaching Dealey Plaza, the motorcade will need to slow down significantly to make the turn onto Elm Street. It's not just a left-hand turn. It's a sharp left-hand turn and coming back at an angle, okay? The vehicle has to virtually stop or go at a very, very low speed to make that hard turn. From a window high up in the book depository, the limo becomes the perfect target for a trained sniper. You don't want to be static or still, and there's a term that's commonly referred to in the surface called get off the X. When you're on the X or when you are static, you are most likely to get hit. The Secret Service then makes another key error. The details of the planned route are passed on to every law enforcement group involved in the president's visit, except the FBI. The Secret Service would fail dramatically in the coming days. But who else knew of the plot to kill the president? The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city. His words divide America. North and South. By giving his famous June 63 speech, he really fanned the flames in the right wing, the kind of people that President Kennedy himself said, well, we're heading to that country now. Kellerman and his agents are doing their best to create an envelope of security around Jackie and the president. Working as a team, they know exactly what to look for. You're looking for something out of place. You're looking for an angry face, somebody with their hands in their pockets. They'll tell them in a nice way, please remove your hands in your pockets. 
This is the stressful part of their job. This is what they signed up for. They knew that when they made the White House detail, they were the elite of the elite. Kellerman and his team are about to be tested like never before. It's raining as Air Force One touches down at Carswell Air Force Base. No one aboard expects anyone to notice the presidential party's arrival this late. But as Roy Kellerman looks out of his window, he mutters, I'll be damned. Thousands have braved the rain, hoping to glimpse Jackie. Roy Kellerman, I'm sure he couldn't believe the crowd. It was like they were greeting a rock star. It was like Beatlemania, even before Beatlemania began with the Kennedys. It might be terrible weather conditions and late at night, but this might be one's only opportunity to see them up close and personal. Kellerman knows not everyone in Texas will be so welcoming. Tomorrow, they are due in Dallas. It's the end of a long first day for Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman. With his charges secure in Suite 850 of the Hotel Texas, he clocks off. But as Kellerman heads to bed, many of his agents head to the bar. Nine agents drank the night before the assassination. That's grounds for removal from the agency. If they only would have left the front and rear pieces on and even had that open piece in the middle, that would have been a security function. It's a psychological deterrent because so many people wrongly assumed it was bulletproof when an assassin or assassins even try with it on. If you listen to the narration that morning on WFAA ABC, they say, wow, the president is amazing. Instead of getting into the president's limousine, he's heading towards the crowd. Secret Service boss Roy Kellerman may be getting used to this scene, but he's not letting his guard down. You can see Roy Kellerman, everybody, He's looking to see that the various local police and local agents are in place. He's looking to see that rope line is there. He's looking to see everything appears to be normal. The motorcade stretches for half a mile. You had the presidential limousine. You had the Secret Service fob car. You had the mayor's car, then you had the vice president car, and you had the Secret Service fob car for him, other various dignitary cars, local congressmen and senators, you had the, the press and so on. The city of Dallas police have deployed over 700 men, but unusually, none are guarding Dallas's many high-rise rooftops. The major trip before in Florida, in Tampa, 28 miles, almost three times the length of Dallas. They had multi-story building rooftops guarded with all the sheriff's department, with heavy arms. In fact, I spoke to the lead uh, motorcycle officer in Tampa. He told me, oh, every multi-story building at 28 miles had armed men, and they would have shot anybody untoward during that motorcade. Got a pretty good crowd of people down here on Turtle Creek. Let me put it. Halfway down Main Street, FBI Special Agent James Hostie watches the motorcade pass by. He's shocked at how exposed the President and First Lady are. All the Secret Service agents are in the car behind. When you realize the building rooftops weren't guarded, there's people hanging all out of windows, you realize they weren't on the back of the car in a concentrated fashion. and there wasn't more motorcycles bracketing the car and even the use of the bubble top. It makes you realize how much Kennedy was a sitting duck. 10-4-1 uh, is a pretty good crowd there. The motorcade turns off Main Street and enters Dealey Plaza. And they make a short right-hand turn onto Houston Street. In the presidential car, Jackie hears Governor Connolly's wife say to the president, you certainly can't say that the people of Dallas haven't given you a nice welcome. And the president says, no, you sure can't. 
Then they make the really tight jog onto Elm Street. Now this was all a violation of Secret Service protocol and common sense. You're never supposed to take the president in a situation where you're slowing the car down like that. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president. I always thought uh, the valor of the Secret Service, how they would literally, you know, throw themselves in front of an ass potential assassin's bullets, and always fascinated me. And the question to me was always, wait a minute, why didn't these agents do more to protect the man? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there were a lot of anomalies, a lot of questions that needed to be answered on the subject. No one has spent more time studying the Secret Service's actions that day than Vince Palomera. Standard operating procedure in an open motorcade would have been for the agents to be running, walking, or jogging with the presidential limousine. And there was also two handrails in the back for an agent or agents to hold on to so they would be in close proximity to the president. Agents not riding on the rear of the limo is a huge issue in this case. The Secret Service agents are powerless to really do much of anything if they're not close to the president. And official mythology, I like to call it, is that President Kennedy allegedly ordered the agents off the car four days before Dallas. Claiming President Kennedy asked for changes to the motorcade's normal security protocols had been a recurring theme during the Warren Commission. I spoke to the special agent in charge of the White House detail, the number one agent, Gerald Bain. I asked him, President Kennedy, I understand, uh, he was difficult to print right he didn't want the agents on the back of the car and he told me this is the exact quote I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car if you look at the newsreels you'll see agents on there well one by one I spoke to many of his colleagues not only in the Secret Service but actually White House aides that were not Secret Service agents and it was a landslide they were all telling me the same thing President Kennedy, very nice man, not difficult to protect, did not order the agents off the back of the car. This complete departure from procedure is captured here as the motorcade begins to leave Love Field Airport in Dallas. Jogging beside the car was an agent in the fog car behind him. Another agent rises from his seat and does hand gestures like this, obviously to order him to cease and desist. The agent stops his tracks three times, not once, not twice, but three times, goes like this. And actually, that's the universal body language for what is going on. Turns out the agent's name was Don Lawton, and he's the agent who's formerly told to cease and desist by shift leader Emery Roberts, who rides in his seat with the hand gestures, and you see Don Lawton going like this. Don Lawton rode on the back of the car on the Chicago trip earlier in 1963, and four days before in Tampa, but he's relegated to meaningless love field luggage duty during the motorcade, uh, during the assassination. It's ridiculous. Secret Service agent Clint Hill is also recalled from his position on the opposite side of the limousine. Emery Roberts had been the only one of three Secret Service shift leaders from the White House that was part of the motorcade. Emery Roberts was in charge of a follow-up car that was immediately behind JFK, full of Secret Service agents. He was the general, so to speak, of the follow-up car. If he said something, that's how it went. Emery Roberts, however, received his orders from Floyd Boring, the number two man of the Secret Service White House detail, based in Washington. Floyd Boring, he was in charge of planning the Texas trip, and he was the one who gave out assignments in an interview with the Assassination Records Review Board in 1996, he stated that there had been no change in policy for the Dallas trip and put the blame on President Kennedy. The number one man and head of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, was on vacation starting the week before the Texas trip, which left the immediate handling of the trip to Boring. Floyd Boring's right-hand man in charge of the logistics on the ground in Texas was Special Agent Winston Lawson. Winston Lawson came from the Buffalo, Syracuse, New York area. He was a former counterintelligence agent in the Army, and he joined the Secret Service in 1959. 
and again, he was an advance agent, an agent that would actually go to the different cities, towns in America and overseas in advance to uh, work with uh, the local police and dignitaries, whatnot, to get everything in line with motorcade rides, building security, etc., etc. Lawson, assisted by agent Roger Warner, set the order of the vehicles in the Dallas motorcade. The normal order would have been to have a pilot car and a lead car, which was done in Dallas. Then you had a flatbed truck of the press photographers in front of the limousine filming and being eyewitnesses, and that in and of itself is a deterrent. Again, you had the press buses close behind the limousine. Again, professional newsmen, eyewitnesses, they would have been there filming. Conveniently, the press has moved back at the last minute. There wouldn't have been a need for Abraham Zapruder, an amateur to film the assassination. Another break from routine in the Dallas motorcade, the positioning of police motorcycles around the president's limousine. As with any other motorcade, the Secret Service worked hand in hand with local authorities to ensure the safety of the president. Usually surrounding the car, there would be a group of motorcycles. This was not only to obscure or block the view of potential assassins, but also to prevent anyone from the public who might be viewing who got too excited from approaching the car. And up to and including the day before the assassination, this held true. It was prior Texas stops in San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth. Normally, there were six to nine motorcycle officers around the presidential limousine in a wedge formation, including flanking the car, which means in translation, they were riding right beside JFK. Then all of a sudden, there is a last minute change, and the motorcycles are reduced to four beside the car, but then they're not even beside the car. They're not flanking anymore. They're moved behind. Translation, the formation was meaningless. It offered no protection at all. In fact, when the shooting began, you don't even see the motorcycle officers around the car. Agent Lawson told the Warren Commission why he had ordered the motorcycles to fall back from the limousine. Well, it's my understanding he couldn't hear conversation well. That's why he didn't want the motorcycles beside him. And yet they had no problem that morning in Fort Worth, the day before in San Antonio and Houston, and four days before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the years before. They left Kennedy a sitting duck. Another line of protection for the president that wasn't used was the limousine's bubble top. The bubble top was a plexiglass covering that was put on the car, the presidential limousine. The conventional wisdom that it was bulletproof or bullet resistant. Turns out it was not bulletproof or bullet resistant in the standard way we think of that. However, it was a psychological deterrent because most people assumed it was bulletproof. Popular belief has it that the limousine's bubble top was not used for two reasons. One, because what started as an overcast and dreary day turned sunny and clear. The actual films and photos of several motorcades shows the bubble top on in the brightest weather conditions imaginable. So there's a myth that it was only on there for inclement weather. Not true. The bottom line with the bubble top would have done is it would have obscured an assassin's view via the sun's glare. The second reason most often given as to why the bubble top had not been used is that the president had requested not to use it. But I spoke to the agent who was the driver of the follow-up car, Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney adamantly on three different occasions told me that President Kennedy had nothing to do with it. It was solely his responsibility. The bubble top came in six pieces, but sometimes it's on there for just the front and rear pieces were on. So it would be an open car and some semblance of protection as well. A partial bubble top with the front and rear pieces on, and he would be able to get air and be able to stand up and he didn't have that configuration. It's just a question of why. Why wasn't at least that configuration used in Dallas? Another troubling inconsistency with Secret Service protocols was the monitoring of buildings. Buildings were not properly monitored in Dallas. Windows were not even properly monitored by the Secret Service. When Lawson said it was his usual instructions to give out these orders to scan the windows along the parade route, but he didn't remember giving out the order or not. And it turns out that Dallas police, who were also involved in security of the motorcade route, said that no orders were given. The bottom line protocol were agents 
or local police or both were supposed to monitor buildings. Dealey Plaza was not properly cleared, was not properly monitored, and the overpasses, any potential overpasses that would have been cleared to spectators and manned by local police. Even more alarming is what happened inside the Secret Service car directly behind the president's limousine once shots rang out. Shift leader Emery Roberts would give an order to the other agents in the car. When the assassination begins, he orders the men not to move. Sam Kinney, the driver of the fall car, who's right beside him, confirmed to me that this happened. He ordered the men not to move at the beginning of the assassination. Emory Roberts supposedly ordered the men not to move. Exactly right. These men were sworn to protect the president, to dive in front of a bullet if need be, to sacrifice their body. And you mean to tell me this man is going to order them to cease and desist when the shooting begins? <laughs> And just what were the Secret Service agents who were actually inside the president's limousine doing at the time of the shooting? Agents Bill Greer and Roy Kellerman were pivotal to the success of the assassination, and they were pivotal to the success of the assassination through inaction. Bill Greer was the driver of the president's limousine in Dallas. Roy Kellerman was riding right beside him. Greer hits the gas pedal, Kennedy lives. <laughs> first shot rings out. Bill Greer looks back at the president. His foot's on the brake too because the car slows down. It's only going 11.2 miles an hour. It's crawling at this point. And then Roy Kellerman says, get out of line, we've been hit. That's when Bill Greer turns around a second time and is staring at Kennedy and doesn't do anything until Kennedy is killed. Yes, it was only six to eight seconds, depending on estimates, but that is a lifetime for Secret Service agents. Count down six to eight seconds and watch the video of Reagan being shot. These men, by the time the eight seconds shot, they're well out of there. Let alone two, three, five seconds. Amazing what they did. And Roy Kellerman, for his part, doesn't jump. He doesn't jump back, and he's turned around, and he's staring at Kennedy, too. The shooting had stopped by the time Clint Hill who was assigned to protect the first lady, finally leapt onto the limousine. Could these monumental lapses by the Secret Service just have been a series of unfortunate oversights? How convenient that this all happened on the day allegedly a lone assassin struck the president down. 1963 protocol, President Kennedy should have lived in Dallas. He should have lived past the Dallas murder case. But Floyd Boring in charge of protection of the president by planning the Texas trip, Emory Roberts in charge of the fall car, and Bill Greer, the driver of the president's car. Those three men bear the largest burden of what went down in Dallas. The buck stops of the Secret Service. Yeah. Roy Kellerman spoke with FBI agents at the president's autopsy. He was quoted with a surprising statement. Agent Kellerman said that the security for this trip was the most stringent and thorough ever employed by the Secret Service for any trip the president ever made. Now, if you believe that, I've got some land I want to sell you. In 1995, the government's Assassination Records Review Board, wanting to compare security in Texas against other recent trips, requested to see all Secret Service documents pertaining to presidential visits around that time. Rather than comply, the Secret Service destroyed many of its records from the fall of 1963, making any true comparisons impossible.
three loud. From his hometown of Duluth in Minnesota, one of those questioning critics of the official version of events is Professor James Fetzer. The resurgence of interest in the death of JFK had repercussions when Congress passed the JFK Records Act in 1992 that created a five civilian member board entrusted with the responsibility to review and declassify documents that were held by the CIA, the Secret Service, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and so forth. We know from its own report that it had some significant failures. For example, and the Secret Service, which deliberately destroyed motorcade records that would have revealed that the motorcade in Dallas was a travesty, a violation of at least 15 different Secret Service policies for presidential protection. This behavior on their part raises the most serious and disturbing questions about their complicity in the entire affair. From the moment he arrived in Dallas, the president's protection was suspect, according to Vince Palomara, a Secret Service expert. There was last minute changes invoked by the Secret Service involving President Kennedy's security. Specifically, agents were told not to ride on or near the rear of the limousine. Now these orders were funneled from the assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the planner of the Texas trip, Floyd Boring, to one of his assistants, a shift leader by the name of Emery Roberts, who was in charge of the follow-up car. You can see an agent, Henry Ribka, doing his normal duty, jogging besides the limousine, when in the follow-up car, you can see Emery Roberts stand up and wave him back, and you can see a very perplexed agent Ribka waving his arms in the air several times in seeming disgust. There was another last-minute change made at Love Field, invoked by the Secret Service. The Dallas Police Department motorcycle outriders were told not to be beside the car. It went from four to six down to a measly two riders on each side. And to add insult to injury, they were pushed further back in the motorcade by those agents not being by the car, by those motorcycle officers not being in the position. It opened up President Kennedy to a field of fire from in front and from the rear. In the months before the trip to Texas, there had been a growing number of threats against the president's life. Despite the increase in conspiratorial activity in the month of November 1963, in the apparent red alert the Secret Service appears to be under in response to this activity, the agency acts in the opposite fashion and actually reduces the security and acts like no threats on the president's life are occurring. Why? Uniquely on that day in Dallas, the press, the camera crews, Kennedy's military aide, who would normally sit in the front of the president's car, and even his personal physician, were all relegated to the rear of the motorcade by the Secret Service. In a conventional motorcade, the president would be somewhere in the middle, surrounded by security and the press. In this case, the presidential limousine was set right out in front of every other limousine, which of course is the reason why the Secret Service destroyed the records of its own motorcades when they were asked for them by the Assassination Records Review Board. The most suspicious behavior by shift leader Emery Roberts was to be at the time of the shooting in Dealey Plaza. Tragically, he actually ordered the agents not to move during the heart of the shooting. Agent Sam Kinney, who drove the fob car, admitted as much to me and told me, quote, exactly right, end quote. And all these deficiencies begin and end with the Secret Service because they were the prime movers. They were the ones who were directing the security arrangements from Washington up to and including in the heart of Dallas during security meetings. They were the ones that gave out assignments vetoed or approved of security arrangements so the buck stops with them uh, for firing a shot it's most unusual incidentally that such a thing could happen because of the uh, unusually tight security measures that are ordinarily taken by the uh, secret service who guard the president and uh, 
normally any vantage point, a rooftop, and uh, windows which command uh, a parade route are carefully scrutinized and carefully guarded, and men are usually posted on rooftops along a parade route, uh, particularly if there is any, any reason at all to suppose that there might be someone in the area who uh, would have uh, uh, such ideas as assassination in his mind regarding the president. These precautions, of course, are taken by the Secret Service for all presidents as they have been for many years. Uh, for firing a shot. It's most unusual, incidentally, that such a thing could happen because of the uh, unusually tight security measures that are ordinarily taken by the uh, Secret Service who guard the president. And uh, normally any vantage point, a rooftop, and uh, windows which command uh, a parade route are carefully scrutinized and carefully guarded, and men are usually posted on rooftops along a parade route, uh, particularly if there is any, any reason at all to suppose that there might be someone in the area who uh, would have uh, uh, such ideas as assassination in his mind regarding the president. These precautions, of course, are taken by the Secret Service for all presidents, as they have been for many years. The destruction of records is actually referenced in the uh, Assassination Records Review Board final uh, report. Uh, very, um, very disappointing. Uh, they were records that related to trips that President Kennedy had taken uh, in the fall of 1963 prior to him going to Dallas. talking about the President of the United States, and uh, I'm not a holier-than-thou guy.
and in the 1960s. I believe that we can demonstrate so that all the world will want to follow our example that freedom and prosperity can move hand in hand. I express our thanks to you, and I can tell you... In Mr. Kennedy's new presidential limousine, the two presidents acknowledge the cheers of the throngs. The end of the parade finds the presidential... El carro del, del presidente y el gobernador, seguido por un carro de capota abierta en el cual irán eh, miembros de la policía secreta de la seguridad del presidente. En el tercer carro también de capota eh, transparente, la señora Kennedy y la señora Muñoz. Está preparándose para salir la caravana desde el aeropuerto todavía no se ha movido el primer carro que es el que lleva al presidente después de estos primeros carros irán los demás con los miembros de la comitiva presidencial y los carros que ustedes habrán de ver por el camino y algunos de ustedes van a ver aquí en la televisión antes de terminar esta transmisión son de fotógrafos y camarógrafos tanto local como de Estados Unidos que han llegado y están cubriendo todo este desfile, toda esta llegada del presidente Kennedy irán tomando vistas a todo lo largo de la avenida Valdoriotti hasta San Juan ahí va el auto del presidente y el gobernador saliendo de la pista de... North Carolina. Here, hard-hitting, battle-ready units armed with the latest weapons are prepared to go into combat at any level of the...
hardly put in a busier weekend than this one in New York. First, he... They get him away at last. Back to Bur con una determinación para preservarla y extender sus frutos a todos. Our route was lined with people who had waited hours to see the president, the man dedicated to the defense of peace and freedom. Never before had the Berliners turned out in such large numbers. Never was a reception so rousing. Und hier also ist einer der dramatischsten Punkte, wo Ost und West sich gegenüberstehen. Wenn Berlin ein Vorposten der freien Welt ist, dann ist der Checkpoint Charlie einer der vorgeschobensten Posten, der am weitesten. 
uh, for firing a shot. It's most unusual, incidentally, that such a thing could happen because of the uh, unusually tight security measures that are ordinarily taken by the uh, Secret Service who guard the president. And uh, normally, any vantage point, a rooftop, and uh, windows which command uh, a parade route are carefully scrutinized and carefully guarded, and men are usually posted on rooftops along a parade route, uh, particularly if there is any, any reason at all to suppose that there might be someone in the area who uh, would have uh, uh, such ideas as assassination in his mind regarding the president. These precautions, of course, are taken by the Secret Service for all presidents, as they have been for many years. Big, beautiful Lincoln, followed by a carload of press. That major development of the January 6th investigation. That development is that the Secret Service Service deleted a large number of text messages on its devices from January 5th and 6th. That's according to a government watchdog group. Lawmakers are now raising some serious concerns, and our congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the very latest for us this morning. Hello there, Rachel. TJ, good morning. Yes, lawmakers say this is deeply concerning. The Inspector General, an independent watchdog with the Department of Homeland Security, says that the Secret Service not only deleted many text messages around the time of January 6th, but that they did it after his office requested them. The Inspector General telling lawmakers that there have been delays and confusion and how these records have been turned over. Guys, let's get to your headlines. 7.30, the Secret Service deleted text messages sent and received around the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. That is according to the Department of Homeland Security's internal watchdog. The in, Department of Homeland Security says the texts were deleted even after an inspector general requested them as part of the investigation. Big, beautiful Lincoln, followed by a carload of press.
uh, for firing a shot. It's most unusual, incidentally, that such a thing could happen because of the uh, unusually tight security measures that are ordinarily taken by the uh, Secret Service who guard the president. And uh, normally, any vantage point, a rooftop, and uh, windows which command uh, a parade route are carefully scrutinized and carefully guarded, and men are usually posted on rooftops along a parade route, uh, particularly if there is any, any reason at all to suppose that there might be someone in the area who uh, would have uh, uh, such ideas as assassination in his mind regarding the president. These precautions, of course, are taken by the Secret Service for all presidents, as they have been for many years. The destruction of records is actually referenced in the uh, Assassination Records Review Board final uh, report. A very, um, very disappointing. Uh, they were records that related to trips that President Kennedy had taken uh, in the fall of 1963 prior to him going to Dallas. clear the agency's name through the release of records. You know, overall, I thought that the Central Intelligence Agency was very cooperative with us. They didn't appeal any of our decisions. The FBI uh, had a, a, a wonderful set of carefully cataloged records. They fought us for a time on all of our releases. Eventually, they gave up. Secret Service, on the other hand, was very difficult for us to deal with. Perhaps that was not surprising because 
in November 22, 1963 was the worst day by far in the long history of the Secret Service. Everything was done poorly that day. This was a very dangerous situation. An open limousine. Secret Service, on the other hand, was very difficult for us to deal with. Perhaps that was not surprising because November 22, 1963 was the worst day by far in the long history of the Secret Service. Everything was done poorly that day. This was a very dangerous situation. An open limousine, crowds everywhere, buildings not checked, parts of a parade route where the, the vehicles had to slow to almost a stop to make that, that corner there, that, that sharp turn under the book depository building. Now all you have to do is look at the films from that day to see people like within two, three feet of the president as the limousine poked its way down the, down the street. So the Secret Service was entirely revamped and procedures and policies were changed entirely on the basis of what happened that day. There was no coordination with local law enforcement that there should have been. The FBI was following Oswald. I mean, obviously they knew he was working in the school book depository building. Was there any discussion ahead of time that this guy was clearly erratic? A little coordination here would have made all the difference in the world. The FBI and the CIA were listening to his conversations in the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City six or seven weeks before the assassination. They knew what this guy was up to. He was, a, he was erratic. Uh, yet no one checked out his employment in the book depository building. In, in terms of after the fact, I mean, I think the Secret Service was most interested in, in getting, you know, the president obviously to the hospital fast and then getting the body out of Dallas. As far as their motivations, uh, you know, obviously they knew they had failed in their job that day. They failed to protect the president of the United States. Did they cover up things after the fact? They probably covered up, you know, not doing their job very well. During the review board's work in 1995, they did destroy records uh, relating to threat assessments in Dallas uh, before November 22, 1963. Lowe hauled them in right away to explain what was going on. No, it was inadvertent. Inadvertent, we're, you've got a law that requires you to present everything to us for our decision. And, uh, well, they blamed some low-level person. I mean, it was just, it, it was inexplicable.